Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the live stream. I hope you're all very well this evening. I uh, want to say a massive thank you to Philippe. Thank you so much, Philippe, for your super chat. Um, you say the EU should uh, should just throw down the gauntlet already. Number 10 has had more than enough time to try and weasel out of the agreements it signed. The EU cannot afford to look weak under any circumstances. And I would agree with that. I, I think what the EU need to do is... Um, threaten sanctions threaten tariffs um because what else do they have no other means to deal with boris johnson um focused tariffs perhaps uh, th there is a way there are certain industries perhaps that they can target that would be extremely bar embarrassing for the conservatives and i think also to respond to the type of rhetoric saying look boris johnson lied to people Come out and say it. What is the alternative to try and be diplomatic? Because dip diplomacy isn't working. Um, the type of diplomacy the European Union usually deal in is not working. So I definitely think something has to change. Thanks, thank you so much for that super chat. Um, so let's see who's on the stream tonight. We have Duke. Great to see you. FSM is the dog. FSM certainly is the dog. We have Chatty Rat. Great to see you, Chatty. The... <laughs> Dominic Cummins, also known as Chatty Rat. We have uh, Raven, great to see you, 1983 Witch. We have also Glasgow Case, okay, great to see you, Glasgow. Hope you're well tonight. We have also Killer, great to have you on Killer. Hope you're well this evening. Uh, we have Derek, great to see you, Derek. Audrey, great to have you on it, Audrey. Kathy Doyle, great to see you. All shorts, hope you're well, great to have you on again. Um, Grimman Moore, great to see you. Hope you're well tonight. We have uh, the Melted Gavin Carmento. <laughs> I love these names. <laughs> Akis Mad, good to see you. Hope you're well tonight. Um, we have uh, Simon, great to see you, Simon. Thanks again once. Uh, thanks again for the super chat, Philippe. Uh, who else have we got on the stream? Oh, we're up to 162 viewers. That's amazing. So. Uh, I'll have to go really quickly as always. We have DM, great to see you. Jerry, great to see you. Charlie, hope you're well. Conservator, hope you're well. Thanks for coming on. We have CGM, great to see you, CGM. Uh, Taurus, great to see you. We also have We Scott's Dog, hope you're well. Geraldine, great to see you. Hope you're well tonight. We have. Uh, Doc, great to see you. Inconsequential, great to have you on. Hope you're well tonight too. Who else have we got? I hope I'm not missing anyone as I'm going down. Pete, great to see you. Kendra, great to have you on. Frenata, Frenata, great to see you. Um, ah, Regan Ali, thank you so much for that super chat. Uh, hi, Max. Thanks for all the hard work and the lovely community you have. Have a drink on me tonight. Thank you so much, Regan Ali. Very kind of you. I certainly will. Um, who else have we got on the stream? We have got Alice, Paul, John, Boomerage, uh, Richard, great to see you. QA Library, great to have you on. Hope you're well. And I'll have to move on because we're so many people on the stream. I, I can't say hello to everyone. I can see Catherine there, Lydia, and uh, John O'Sullivan. Great to see you all. So... Uh, I'm gonna. I want to start off with Northern Ireland and Brexit, of course. Uh, what a week it's been! So many things, so many fools of the week. I, I try to cover. Most of you probably know there is um, uh, a video every week called Fool of the Week, and as the problem with Fool of the Week is, as soon as I make one Fool of the Week, the next day there is another fool who would be a perfect candidate, and the day after there's another fool. And it, I should maybe change it to fool of the day <laughs> or someone on the comment section said uh, fool of the hour because it's it's getting, you know, it's getting difficult to keep up with all of these fools. So I just want to start with this one here. It says um, thousands gather in Belfast to protest against Northern Ireland Protocol. So it says here, you can see here on the poster, Shankill Road says no to Irish Sea Border. The battle we refuse, the, sorry, the battles we refuse to fight today become the hardships our children must endure tomorrow. <laughs> uh, these people campaigned for Brexit, remember. 
we only have 72, 62 likes, 176 viewers. Smash that like button, guy. Uh, no hero, no hero of the week this time though. Um, I'm hoping to have it hero of the week maybe for Saturday or Sunday. So that's that. Sunday is literally is technically the last day of the week. So I promise I'll I'll try and get in. Um, I have so many videos to make. It's it's difficult to to cover so many topics. Um, so cover so many things so I, I definitely will try to get in the, the hero of the week there is a perfect candidate for hero of the week not political but uh, still a hero so I want to read just a section of this of course what's happening in Northern Ireland there is the Northern Ireland protocol and the consequence of the withdrawal agreement consequence of Brexit which many loyalists and some unionists in Northern Ireland voted for but of course they're not happy with and as we're getting closer to the marching season, for those who don't know, every uh, towards the beginning of uh, July, mid-July, there is a, a, what's called the marching season, where orange men put on their bowler hats and sashes and march up and down streets um, in their own areas and also in areas that they're not wanted. They play um, music on with ba they have bands playing music including using sorry drums and whistles and flutes and some of the music is quite uh how can i say controversial <laughs> um and they in some cases uh, attack members of the catholic community in northern ireland uh, it's a it's a disaster it's been a disaster for for decades for maybe even you could say even a century um but it happens every year. The, the orange men march up and down. There are other also, sorry, there are also other um, pro-British or loyalist groups. I think the Apprentice Boys is another one, and but they're more in Derry, I think it is. Anyway, let's continue. So it says here, warnings have been issued by police after thousands of people gathered in West Belfast to protest over no the Northern Arm Protocol. Loyalists gathered in Woodvale on Thursday evening uh, to stage a demonstration and a parade that then took place uh, along the Shankill Road. Footage on social media showed the burning of a United Ireland banner that was displayed on the national side of the Peace Wall earlier this year. Uh, police estimate that more than 3,000 people took part in excess of the number allowed to gather in public uh, currently under coronavirus regulations. Under the, pro uh, under the protocol in the Belfast Withdrawal Agreement, destined to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland, Northern Ireland in effect remains in the single market and the EU customs policy is enforced on goods coming from mainland Britain. Remember, I don't know if you guys saw the, the video I uploaded today about mainland <laughs> and Southern Ireland. So was a, what was his name? Uh, Colonel Mustard has something to say about that. Uh, this year there have been loyal there has been there has been loyalist violence from from those who claim their British identity is being brought into question by these arrangements. Now I've never understood this point that they're trying to make here. This is about goods moving from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. It's not about people. Loyalists, unionists, they're free to move between Northern Ireland and Great Britain and back again. They're still using sterling they have their own pound of course in northern ireland but they're still using uh, pound sterling and they still have their passports maybe some of them even have blue passports what do they want like how is this affecting their their identity and it was quite uh it was quite worrying that you had lord frost mention the word identity in um his communique or his press release a few days ago um all shorts just watched your video on gordon brown brilliant i haven't seen it i, I definitely will check it out uh but max you promised a hot tub live stream <laughs> you know boris johnson promised a lot of things <laughs> so talks uh talks on resolving the impasse over the implementation of the protocol collapsed without agreement earlier this week U.S. President Joe Biden, who was in Cornwall for the G7 summit this weekend, has urged the U.K. to settle its rows with the EU. There are fears that the issue uh, could overshadow the whole summit, and the French President Emmanuel Macron warned that nothing is negotiable with the protocol. 
In Belfast, Chief Inspector Darren Fox said police were in attendance and a number of warnings were issued. He said footage will be examined for suspect breaches of the public health rules. So here's a here's a, a short video of these people marching. I love this where it says here, Bogdan, thank you so much for that super chat. I uh, want to be rich, be a Tory and a scumbag. <laughs> yes. Um, actually, if you want to be rich, donate to the Conservative Party. You could, you know, if you have a few, if you have ten grand lying around somewhere. <laughs> You know, as you do, uh, take it out, take it out from behind the sofa or under, you know, on the, between the, the cushions on the sofa, about 10 grand and donate it to the Conservative Party and you will have a massive return on, on investment. You'll be given a contract worth millions or even or at least hundreds of thousands of pounds. So you can see here, trigger, uh, protect Northern Ireland, peace process, trigger Article 16. These people don't actually understand what triggering Article 16 means. Maybe they like the word trigger. You know it's a peaceful protest when <laughs> the guy at the front of it is wearing a balaclava. <laughs> you know, they they were wearing they're wearing uh, face masks, but that's not exactly the type of face mask we're 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 suggesting you wear. This is a protect Northern Ireland, uphold Northern Ireland's sovereignty. Okay. Sorry, I just want to see it says something there about Joe Biden. Wow, okay, you can see, I don't know if you guys can see it. It says here, Joe Biden is an enemy of Ulster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> These people are insane. Anyway, and it continues like that. Um, Peter, thank you so much for that super chat. I have two pounds. Very good. Thank you so much. Very kind of you. So these people uh, about them, they are being thrown under a bus by the Brexiteers, being thrown under a bus by Boris Johnson. Um, it would be nice if Boris Johnson went, you know, flew over in his uh, in his private plane to meet with these people, have a chat with them, explain to them why Brexit was a good idea. Um, we'll see how, how that would uh, that would fly with them. Organizers of parades and possessions are re give formal notification of their intentions, uh, which was regrettable not regrettably not provided or forthcoming. Yes, you, do you think these people care about the law? Do you think these keep these people care about uh, public uh, public safety? No, not really. So someone else also got involved in this uh, in these sort of shenanigans. Morrison. So I want to show you. Ah, <laughs> Bugger, thank you so much. I have two pounds and one pence. <laughs> it's a bidding war now. <laughs> um, thanks for that. <laughs> and then set it all on fire. Yes, and then of course part of the the. Uh, 12th of July um, events is also to burn pallets in the center of the towns. Uh, Thorn Thor, thank you so much for the Thorn. Thank you so much for that super chat. Thorn Thorn. Um, Thorn Thorn, sorry. I know I'm saying apologies. Um, thanks so much for that super chat. I'm looking for people willing to start a postcard campaign to the Northern Ireland telling um, number one, you are in the EU by <laughs> By Bojo's decision, yes. <laughs> and they have, in a sense, sped up the process of a United Ireland. Brexit helped along a, a United Ireland immensely. These people thought that they were building a between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. 
and instead they're building a wall in a sense at the moment it's a it's just on goods but they're gradually building a wall between great britain and northern ireland and these people campaigned for it the dup told people to go out and vote for brexit they didn't know what they were voting for and oh no buffering again i need to sort this out i really don't understand what's happening unless it's the football i seem to have the stream at the wrong time <laughs> Is that Van Morrison? Yes, that is Van Mo Van Morrison. And it says here, Van Morrison and Ian Paisley's attack on health minister branded disgusting. So what happened was Van Morrison is a bit of a, it seems a bit of a idiot. Yeah, bloody football <laughs> buffering. Um, uh, you're welcome. Uh, you're welcome. Number two is you're welcome in the EU. Number three, blame Bojo. Uh, who thrown you under the bus and bring the sausage uh, prod in the U in, in Northern Ireland creating jobs. <laughs> um, yeah, so this whole thing of the sausage, like it seems that the local sausage production is increasing. So the, the protocol is actually promoting local businesses and also businesses on the island of Ireland. Um because it's easier to import goods from the Republic of Ireland into Northern Ireland and it's easier um, for goods that are produced in Northern Ireland to be exported uh, to other parts of, well, to, to be consumed in Northern Ireland, obviously. Uh, thanks for that super chat, Ton. If England uh, don't win the Euros, uh, we will blame the EU for it. Yes, of course. <laughs> What's his name? Graham Grimes? No, Gr I, I don't know. Not Graham Grimes. Darren Grimes, I think his name is. Uh, he'll probably blame the EU. Great to, great to see you on the, st on the stream. He's an anti-vaxxer, isn't he? I, I don't know about anti-vaxxer, but he's definitely a covid idiot because he's against lockdowns. Uh, look, I'm, I'm not a fan of lockdowns, but I know they're necessary. Some people don't think they're necessary, and I generally brand those people as COVID idiots. So it says here, Van Morrison and Ian Paisley's attack on, Bra um, on Health Minister Brandon Disgusting. So I'm going to show you a clip of that in a moment. It says here, Ulster Unionist leader Doug Beatty has branded an on-stage attack on Northern Ireland's Health Minister by Sir Van Morrison and a DUP MP as disgusting. It goes on to say, Sir, Ma Sir Van uh, was joined by Ian Paisley at the Europa Hotel as he criticised Robin Swan following the late cancellation of concerts in Belfast this week. Four gigs scheduled by the musician at the hotel were cancelled um, at the last moment on Thursday because live music is still not permitted under Covid restrictions. The management of the hotel blamed confusion by Stormont ministers for the late notice, believing that they had been given the green light to proceed. The event went dinner before a video of a previous gig by the Belfast singer-songwriter was played. Uh, Sir Van, an outspoken critic of COVID restrictions, told uh, took to the stage where he addressed the audience of 140 and claimed that Mr. Swan had called him dangerous <laughs> during an interview with Rolling Stone magazine. Footage of the event at the uh, Rope Hotel on Thursday uh, night showed Van Morrison, Sir Van, um, saying... Robin Swan has got all the power. He's keeping us in this for uh, for over 15 months. Then repeated chanting, Robin Swan is very dangerous. The footage was shown. Uh, footage then shows him inviting DUP MP Ian Paisley onto the stage where they continued the chant. Sir Van then says, this stops when we say no. So I want to show you uh, part of this. See if we can get it going. Robin Swan says, and as if you feel with Rolling Stone magazine, I was dangerous. Okay, well, if I can't affect any change in this situation. Ah. Right? I don't have any power. Or my power is very limited to change this situation. Robin Swan has got all the power. He's keeping us in this over 15 months. All I have to say is, if I don't have any power, my power is like extremely limited, if at all. Robin Swan's got all the power. So I say, Robin Swan is very dangerous. Robin Swan is very dangerous. 
Robert Swan is very dangerous. Robert Swan is very dangerous. Robert Swan is very dangerous. <laughs> this guy is insane. <laughs> Robert Swan is very dangerous. Robert Swan is very dangerous. Come on, Junior, you want to deal with me? Come on. Come on. Robin Swan is very, very dangerous. dangerous. Robin Swan is extremely, extremely dangerous. Anyway, Brian, this. No, 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 no. This stops when we say no. Right? That's when it stops. Thank you, Junior. I think Ian may have had a few too many to drink. <laughs> um, Peter, thank you so much for that super chat. Always wanted to see you, <laughs> see you on uh, on sing uh, sing on karaoke. <laughs> Thanks very much for that super chat. You're not going to hear me singing. You might hear Ian Paisley singing. Uh, Evening gammons, Night Raven. Great to see you. Um, Rusty Transit is <laughs> hardly catches. <laughs> it's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not exactly catchy no uh so there has been a huge amount of support it seems for uh oops i clicked on something here. Uh, it seems to be a huge amount of support for the for uh, the health minister robin swan uh following this he must have been drinking <laughs> yes <laughs> i think drinking quite a lot like the african church <laughs> Can I have a hallelujah? Yeah. <laughs> this is the end. Yes. So let's move on. Okay. Staying, of course, with Brexit. Uh, well, before we before we move, move on, I want to read some of some more of your comments, guys. Remember, you can hit me with a super chat if you'd like me to read out your comment on the stream, and you can also support the channel by becoming a patron. And of course, after the stream, there is the post stream chat uh, on Discord, so you're all welcome to to join that if you're a patron. Um, let's see what kind of song what, what kind of song what kind of songwriter is this when he can't even find a rhyme with dangerous <laughs> um, who let the boomers out <laughs> very good is, uh, is Ian Paisley Jr. a boomer <laughs> well, well we'll put him into that category um He's saying Robin Swan is dangerous. He's got a neck on him. He has. What has Robin Swan done to, to upset Van Morrison? So Robin Swan, well, he's blaming Robin Swan for cancelling these uh, these events because of COVID. And obviously, someone who's against lockdowns probably doesn't really believe in COVID. So Van Morrison probably believes that there's no, there is no COVID or there is nothing to worry about. And um, he's... And for this reason that he's uh, he's attacking the health minister. And he's probably lost money. That's probably the the real problem here. He, he probably had a few events uh, prepared and at the last minute they were cancelled and he's not too happy about that. And he, perhaps he's lost money or he's um, he's not going to make money in, in, the, in that sense. Andy, thank you so much for that super chat. I think I said the same thing. Admittedly, probably, uh, admittedly, probably also a bit so uh, sourced, but I mean it. I mean it about me, and I'm going to. And sorry, and I was online gaming. Sorry, I'm confused. I think I said the same thing. Probably, admittedly, probably uh, also a bit sourced. <laughs> but I, I I said the same. Okay, sorry, I said the same thing. Um, but I mean it about me, and I'm and I'm an online and uh, and I was online gaming. <laughs> okay, yeah, there's a bit of a difference when you say it, um, and when a politi well, a celebrity says it in front of a group of politicians on live, uh, well, not live TV, but in front of cameras, there is a little bit of a difference. <laughs> so don't worry too much about that, Andy. Jeebus has has to silence the feed for the whole thing. Okay, let's let's move on. Um, so Boris Johnson plays down Brexit issues after G7 talks with Biden. 
So PM calls US president a breath of fresh air. <laughs> yes. And strikes optimistic tone about Northern Ireland tensions. So what's interesting about this is that Boris Johnson may begin to realize that he's not going to get a trade deal with the United States now. And this could be good. This could be good for Northern Ireland because this would mean this would take off some of the pressure um, over you know signing trade deals that would lower standards and drive a wedge or at least a divergence between the UK and the EU on standards. If the if the, the Biden administration says, look, we're not going to sign any trade deals with you for the foreseeable future, this could give Boris Johnson an opportunity to align more with the European Union, stay outside the single market and the customs union, but realign a little bit. And this would um, allow him to implement the the measures necessary within the Northern Ireland Protocol. It would, because at the moment he doesn't want to align with the European Union because he wants to sign trade deals with the United States and cut standards. It, there's also news that the, the Australians are not in a hurry at the moment to sign a trade deal with the UK. Seems they have pulled out, which could be a blessing in disguise in a sense. Anyway, it says here, Boris Johnson sought to play down any differences with Washington over the, the way Brexit could affect Northern Ireland after talks with Joe Biden at the G7 summit, as he called the US president a, a breath of fresh air. What was the <laughs> what was the previous president? Maybe air, but from a different uh, orifice. Uh, speaking to, uh, to TV reporters after bilateral talks with Biden at the summit venue in Cornwall, where... Um, where according to Downing Street the pair discussed COVID and the climate emergency as well as Northern Ireland Johnson called the discussions very good uh, Peter thank you so much for that super chat Boris mini Trump look like and the Biden administration remember that they remember the comments Boris Johnson has made about Barack Obama for example in the past um, and about the Democrats I think he made some comments about the Democrats but in particular it was about Joe, Bi um, sorry, Joe Biden's previous boss Barack Obama um, there's no question that under President Biden there's been a massive amount um, that had that the new administration wants to do together with the UK on everything from security working together protecting our values around the world together uh, but also on climate change the Prime Minister said so it's a breath of fresh air it's new it's interesting and we're working very hard together and this was predictable Thanks, Peter, for that. Um, this this was predictable because jo um, when Joe Biden won, Boris Johnson flipped. He was like, oh, okay, who who was the previous president? I don't remember. Donald who? You know, this, this is typical Boris Johnson. He has no loyalties. He has no interest. He was, he was kissing Donald Trump's arse when it was convenient. Now he's kissing Joe Biden's arse. Um, Ehrman, thank you so much for that super chat. Good evening, Max and everyone, and everyone else. I'm uh, I'm protected now against any kind of mutant. Wish there was a vaccine against ignorance. Congratulations on getting your vaccine. Uh, I'm waiting for mine, but mine is a bit more complicated. Um, yes, there is no vaccine against ignorance, I'm afraid. And unfortunately, I've been able to demonstrate that over the last number of days with some of the videos. And I have some more... Uh, examples in the pipeline, I'm afraid. Thanks very much for that super chat, Airman. It goes on to say, the pair also formally uh, agreed a document called the Atlantic Charter, a reinstatement of common positions in areas uh, including trade, science, human rights, and the environment. Well, this is amazing because, you know, Don sorry, I keep saying Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, if Donald Trump is old news. I need to get, I need to, flush <laughs> flush that one away okay um boris johnson <laughs> maybe they're related i don't know but boris johnson um on human rights yes we look at the policies been trying to push through parliament recently before the g7 some of the senior u.s um, senior u.s diplomats in london warned boris 
uh, war, war, sorry, warned Johnson's Brexit negotiator, Lord Frost, that he would inflame tensions in Northern Ireland if he did not compromise with the EU over the impasse about Brexit check, uh, border checks. Uh, Johnson expressed confidence that the US and UK could reach an agreement on the issue, but gave no details. He's not a details man. One thing we all absolutely want to do is to uphold the, good, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and to make sure that we keep the balance of the peace process going. That's, abs um, that's absolutely common ground and I'm absolutely optimistic that we can do that. Which really means nothing because whatever Boris Johnson says doesn't really mean anything. It's, it's more interesting to look at what, you know, the, I, I do trust the British government when they say that they're going to uphold the Good Friday Agreement. Um, because there will be sanctions against them if they if they don't. Biden was sim similarly um, evusive over uh, about what he called a very productive meeting, referring to these post -talk, post talks comments to the special relationship between the US and UK, a term which Johnson is reportedly not a fan. Hmm. The U.S. president said we affirmed the special relationship, which is not uh, which is not said lightly. The special relationship between our people, um, and renewed uh, sorry and renewed our commitment to defending the enduring de democratic values that both our nations share. However, Johnson is likely to face considerable pressure from EU leaders at the summit with the French president Emmanuel Macron. Um, using the pre-G7 press conference at the Elysee in Paris to describe the UK approach as not serious. This is something I would prefer Macron not to do because this is a very difficult situation, is a very tense situation. And I think it, it makes more sense for the EU and the UK to deal with this and not member states, with the exception maybe of Ireland, but not other member states not sticking their oar in I, just, I don't think it helps the situation i think it makes more sense just to leave it between the eu and the uk um when i when i say ireland when i give the exception to the ireland i make the exception of ireland it's because ireland is in a particular position but this is not really france's business germany's business um when, when it comes to trade yes but when it comes to the issue of northern ireland and peace in northern ireland i would prefer that Macron and others keep their nose out. Um, they're right. What they're saying is true. Everything they've said so far is correct. But I don't think it helps the situation. Um, <laughs> Trump was a stale fart. A fine example of onomatopoeia. <laughs> yes, Trump. Rump. Uh, Constance, thank you so much for that super chat. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, so <laughs> we couldn't do Brexit without Dominic Raab <laughs> so I just want to show you a clip I'm not going to show all of it of course I'm not going to endure endure you t I'm not going to make you endure um, or inflict Dominic Raab too much on you but I want to show you this clip from Sky News uh, about what's happening of course with um peace in northern the the northern Ireland, protocol and peace in northern ireland in respect to brexit uh, heard i should say from uh, president biden who has said that uh, he does not want any inflammation of tensions as far as the northern ireland peace accord is concerned and you really need to keep an eye on that with brexit we've also heard from president macron he's saying nothing is negotiable where does that leave britain i'm fine look um I was in the room, unlike Lisa and Andy. It was an incredibly warm bilateral meeting yesterday, which overran because they were focused on all the common values and common interests, uh, from uh, getting the world vaccinated to dealing with the challenge of climate change, from the traditional foreign policy, geopolitical concerns from Russia to China. We did touch on, the Prime Minister and the President did touch on uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, and we understand the US interest in it as a long-standing guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement. And it was an opportunity for the Prime Minister to explain that we want a flexible, pragmatic approach that deals with the equities on both sides. But for What does that mean? Would somebody please tell me what does that mean? A pragmatic approach. There is a rule. The EU said you need to follow the rule. The rule that was agreed. What's pragmatic about that? Like, what do you want the EU to do? They just keep saying 
pragmatic and realistic and common sense. But if it's written down in black and white, what do you want them to do? Actually, yes, I know what I want, what they want the EU to do, is to ignore the rules. For that to happen, the EU must be less purist, more pragmatic and more flexible. In the Does he have a list? <laughs> purist, uh, pragmatic, up to, uh, uh, common sense, all of these are listed, you know, and he has to hit each of them. There's a, a bell ring in his mind when, OK, I got that one, I got that one, I got that one. The implementation of it. The ball is very much in the EU's court in relation to that. Frankly, we didn't linger on it. The President, the Prime Minister didn't linger on it. There were so many other things that were discussed, in particular, uh, with the first G7 in almost two years, getting leaders together, dealing with the, uh, the forward-looking problems and challenges of the future, from keeping trade open, from building back the economies greener, stronger, uh, getting the world vaccinated. Uh, I just want to, yes, yeah, sugar-free <laughs> said, pragmatic purist, uh, signed under duress. <laughs> this was one of the comments that, and I shared, a, a, I shared um, an image from, I think it was from The Express today on Twitter, you know, how did we go from we hold all the cards to we sign the agreement under duress? The EU forced us to sign it, but we held all the cards before. We are we are twisting the EU's arm. Now it's they were twisting our arm. And, and the Brexiteers don't seem to have a problem with this inconsistency. Uh, on which we've made a very substantial announcement today. Our um, big uh, cause of getting 40 million more girls into 12 years of quality education, those were the things... OK, and, and then that's and then it starts talking about other things. Um, the ball is not in the EU's court. The ball is in your court. You know the ball is in your court and you need to do your job. You, you have it written down in front of you. This is what we have to implement. We have to carry out these checks. We have to put in the infrastructure, we have to uh, install the software and the computers, we have to train the staff, we have, we have to hire the staff, and we have to train the staff. And a lot of that has not taken place. You can't blame the EU for that. You agreed to do it. And unfortunately, the reason, you know, while you think there's nothing really to worry about, you have these idiots, okay? Remember these guys? They don't understand what the protocol is about. They just know that they don't like it. And when you talk about the EU needing to do their job and the ball is in their court, these fools think it's the EU's the problem, when in reality, this guy is the problem. <sighs> um, Timberwolf says the UK has never respected Ireland. So if other EU countries don't stick in there or how the fuck do you um, expect the UK to wake up, Max? I understand that. Um, but I, I think it, it the pressure needs to come from the EU because unfortunately, and what you're saying is correct, but unfortunately in the UK press, they love Macron interfering. They hate Macron. They hate the French. They hate Mac. Uh, Merkel, if these people comment, it, it's like red meat, unfortunately, to the to the Brexiteers. And I don't think it actually helps the situation. And it doesn't help Ireland because Ireland said, look, we're trying to reach out to the UK government. Um, the EU is saying, look, they have their job to do. The, the Irish are trying to work as facilitators, it seems, or go-betweens, um, which can be good or not. But... Max, you're too polite. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> okay, let's let's move on. Um, it just staying on Brexit, of course. EU tries to loosen Brexit deadlock. With, so, as I said before, the EU is trying to trying to do whatever it can because it's caught between a rock and a hard place. The, this is the problem for the EU. They, if they undermine the single market, this would be pretty much the end of the European Union. The single market is extremely important to the European Union, so they have to defend it. But they also have to defend a member state, the Republic of Ireland, because of the situation in Northern Ireland. They want to protect the Good Friday Agreement. They understand that the British government don't care about the Good Friday Agreement. They will, they will say that they care about the Good Friday Agreement, but in reality, Boris Johnson doesn't 
understand the Good Friday Agreement. He doesn't care about it. And Brexiteers don't care about Northern Ireland either. We've heard from, from them on numerous occasions saying, um, you know, we care more about Brexit than we do about Northern Ireland. Um, there was a government minister, I think it was either a Tory MP or a government minister, who said, but Northern Ireland is far away. I care about my constituents, and my constituents voted for Brexit. That was a few weeks or months ago. I did a video on it. So these are the type of people we're talking about, people who don't understand Northern Ireland, don't care about Northern Ireland, and don't care about the Good Friday Agreement. So the EU is trying to protect the Good Friday Agreement when you have some idiot on the other side who doesn't understand it and is trying to hack away at it because it wants to to look tough for these people. And at the same time, the EU doesn't want to undermine the single market. I, you know, I said in one of the videos recently that it was probably a mistake to trust Boris Johnson's government to carry out these checks. But then on the other hand, there was no alternative because the UK government would not allow um, European officials into Belfast, into Lorne to carry out these checks. It, it would have been seen as infringing on, so on British sovereignty. Um, okay, so this is about this colour code that I want to show it to you in a moment. So it says EU tries to loosen Brexit deadlock with colour-coded plan for Swiss-style deal. Br Brussels laid out options for avoiding checks on food entering Northern Ireland from Great Britain. And you see the picture of the sausages here. All Brexit border checks on food, including chilled meats, entering Northern Ireland from Great Britain uh, would be abolished if the UK signed up to a, si a Swiss-style trade, a Swiss-style veterinary agreement, the EU has said. Now, it's important. This is interesting because Nigel Farage made a suggestion about this some years ago. He was saying, we could have a Swiss-style agreement. Um, as the escalating row over Northern Ireland threatened to develop into a full-blown trade war, the EU tried to ease tensions with the publication of a new chart on Wednesday night. It gave fresh details on alternatives to the controversial checks on fresh food, including sausages from um, after Brexit. According to the Red amber and green categorizations of food the swiss style deal would remove all documentary and uh, physical checks on red meat poultry mince fish and dairy pets would be able to travel um, between great britain and northern ireland without a, a pet passport the uk has also has already ruled out this option because it requires regulatory alignment with the eu so if the eu said this is what this is what's available and the UK government said we don't want that then you can't blame the EU for for the consequences in Northern Ireland I don't know where we're going to go with this the Swiss style agreement sounds feasible it is feasible but it requires regulatory alignment so the UK government would have to align, and this would mean that they would not be able to sign their trade deals with Australia and the United States because they want to lower the standards. They want to diverge from European standards. So it says the table also set out in detail what would happen if a deal was uh, were modelled on the veterinary agreement between New Zealand and Australia, showing 100% abolition of checks on beef, lamb, chicken cheese and milk and you can see this here i don't know if you, it's very small but you can sort of you can find this image online anyway however it did not solve the the sausage dispute as fresh british minced meat would be banned from entering northern ireland the table showed that documentation um, required for fresh meat would also be simplified echoing change uh, claims by the european commission vice president at the press conference on, on monday uh, in London on Monday, that he had offered the UK a solution on meat. If you're sending a, if you're sending sausage, uh, cheese, or meat products to Northern Ireland, the very easy solution is to put a sticker on it for Northern Ireland only, and we agreed to a simplified export health certificate. Um, Regan Ali, thank you so much for that super chat. Um, 
Julie Hartley, Julie Hartley Brewer, yes, said on Talk Radio, throwing Northern Ireland under a bus was a price worth paying to get Brexit done. I saw that and I shared it on uh, Twitter today, um, and I'm not surprised because that was what I, I had been saying for a long time. When it came to Northern Ireland, Brexiteers didn't give a crap. When it came to the Union, Brexiteers didn't give a crap. When it came, when it comes to Scotland leaving the European Union, as the 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 United Kingdom, I should say, not the European Union, didn't get a chance there. Um, Scotland leaving the Union. If it influ- if it Im- impacts Brexit in any way, um, we don't give a crap. Peace in Northern Ireland, we don't give a crap. We want our Brexit. Even if, if Brexit breaks up the Union, we don't care. If Brexit pushes Northern Ireland it, towards a United Ireland, we don't care. These people don't understand Scotland. They don't understand Northern Ireland. They don't understand peace. They don't care about any of this. They wanted their Brexit. They got their Brexit. And they're still complaining about it. Matt Kilcoyle, a deputy director of the Adam Smith Institute, said that the chart showed how flexible the EU would be if the prevailing politics favoured a UK desire for a New Zealand-style deal. The table is fascinating because uh, what has been done in colour-coded is totally arbitrary decisions over the needs uh, to be documented and what gets physically checked, he said. The figures just seem to be a finger in the air uh, exercise with no scientific basis as to why there should be a 10% physical check on dairy coming from uh, coming into the EU from New Zealand as opposed to 30% coming from the UK. Um, Sam Lowell, a senior research fellow at the Centre of European Reform, said the obvious uh, solution was a Swiss-style deal for Northern Ireland even on a temporary basis to allow the UK government to diverge in the future for the sake of trade of a trade deal with another country such as the US. Lowell said the New Zealand style deal would be uh, with a separate sausage style deal would be uh, the answer. A New Zealand style and type deal doesn't help with all the products and it doesn't remove all the checks but it does uh, but it reduces the level of interventions and could be combined with uh, the expansion of the trusted trade uh, trader scheme to co- uh, to continue, for example, to allow British sausages to be sold in Northern Ireland supermarkets. So, there, yeah, there are a number of different approaches, but none of this is acceptable because it requires alignment. So it's going nowhere. Um, can we chuck them under a bus under the three hundred and fifty million pound bus? Yes, you can. Please do. I think a lot of Brexiteers will simultaneously claim to be sacrificing Northern Ireland as a price worth paying, and claiming that they're angry with the EU for now not being flexible enough. What goes on in their minds? Is it we just don't care? I prefer to come out and say, look, we don't care. I've never cared about Northern Ireland. I looked at Northern Ireland as a waste, as a, 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 um, a weight on the British taxpayer. I, I prefer they just actually came out and said that. I'm actually happy that Northern Ireland is going. The Republic can have it. We don't want it. Um, if Brexit speeds up United Ireland, I'm happy with that. There are Brexiteers who will say that behind closed doors, but perhaps some of them are starting to feel uh, more comfortable about saying it in public now. <laughs> the £350 ma- million pound bus is just an old banger. <laughs> um, who's going to carry out the checks? We still haven't got enough. Yes. There's no way the EU would give in to anything before the UK starts to adhere to their arrangements. Yeah, well, what's the point in saying, okay, we'll give you a deal if, you know, Boris Johnson's, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll go with the deal, and then they don't respect the deal. What's the point in giving them something if they're um, not going to agree to it? So I think this is, in a sense, the EU saying, look, this is what's available. We've done ours, you know, we've, we're not breaking the rules, we're not breaking the agreement, and at the same time, we're being flexible. Here are, here are some possible options. Now it's your turn. And, of course, the response from the British government is, um, no, this is too rigid or whatever. 
Uh, Conservator, thank you so much for that super chat. Um, Boris will just throw Northern Ireland under a bus and get the uh, US trade deal to throw the rest of the UK under the bus too. I'm afraid so. Uh, um, Boris Johnson is the bus. <laughs> We're all going under it. Uh, Sugar Free follows on from Conservator. Thanks, uh, Conservator. It is. Um, get rid of, you know, we don't care about Northern Ireland. Throw it under a bus. That's trade deal. Hormone treated beef, uh, GMO, everything brought in. OGM, sorry, in Italy they call it GMO. OGM um, imported, no problem whatsoever. Uh, we, you know, we're able to profit from this. Our, our collapsed. Well, that's, that's part of it, you know. Some businesses... How do you say? How do you call them? Uh, hedge fund, hedge fund managers and their portfolios or whatever can just sweep in and buy up all of these industries really cheaply. German bus manufacturers to the rescue. <laughs> Very well put. Okay, before we move on, of course we're half almost halfway through the stream tonight, so I do want to just. Uh, Bring in one of our comedy videos for a moment, and then we'll be back to the serious business in a moment as well. So let's see this one works. Damn football tonight, slowing everything down. Um, when will the unionists in Northern Ireland realize the English don't give a crap about them? They will never. Uh, the unionists and the loyalists are two different um, beasts, it must be remembered. The unionists are are a bit more pragmatic they understand some of them understand that the vulture funds yes so um some of the unionists understand that look i prefer to stay part of the united kingdom but i understand that is that another dominic <laughs> video would no it is not um i understand that we're moving towards the United Ireland and I, you know, I, we just have to live with that. The loyalists are not willing to accept that and they don't care what the English think. They will continue to be loyal to the crown. They, they're not loyal to Britain. They're loyal to the crown. That's the way they see it. And nothing will break that. Following the 1936 Berlin Olympics, players were encouraged to join their hosts and give the Nazi salute prior to the match. Reluctantly, they agreed. And for many years, it has been a great... Oh my God, what's the problem tonight? What's wrong with football, Max? Football. The problem with football is it seems to be slowing down my internet connection or uh, the connection to, to YouTube for some reason. I don't really understand what the hell is going on tonight. Same thing happened uh, on Tuesday. Unless it's my problem, but th there were some other events taking place, it seems. Source of shame to many involved, including the Football Association. The point here is that, regardless of original intention, the mixing of politics and football has disastrous consequences. Those football. Ah, this is unwatchable. Oh my god, okay. Imagine being loyal to a crown. <laughs> These people are loyal to the crown. Um, the, the, the ironic thing, or the weird thing about this, is they're loyal to something. But that something isn't loyal to them. Football buffering, great. <laughs> football tonight. Okay, maybe it's working a bit better now. Those footballers probably thought all they were doing by giving the Nazi salute was saying no to anti-German racism. Bet they felt pretty silly when people started getting murdered. Naive, simple-minded Wokies may think that by saying Black Lives Matter, they just mean Black Lives Matter. But those of us who read The Telegraph know that what it actually means is it is my will to join the Communist Party of China and dismember the nuclear family. For those of you saying it's only a small portion of people who support Black Lives Matter who are Marxists, I'm sorry, but movements don't work like that. Protests are defined by the tactics and slogans of its most annoying members. That's why I'm afraid... <laughs> I love that. Suffragettes were all terrorists. And why the strategic direction of Extinction Rebellion is driven by smug yoga and statements like don't be racist at a football game, okay? 
That's not why people watch football. Some go to just enjoy a good game and have fun, but some go for a jolly bit of rough and tumble and some politically incorrect banter. Political statements should not be allowed to compromise the age-old tradition of ribbing players off pitch with some cheeky wedgies, wet willies, and hundreds of racially abusive tweets to your favorite players afterwards. These fans want to watch a game and escape the grime of daily life without people wagging their finger and lecturing them that all white people are racist. Because if you mention racism, you're blaming all of us. It's the same reason I opposed the anti-bullying campaign at my niece's school. I said, oh, Billy gets his head flushed down the loo and suddenly we're all bullies, are we? Anyway, I got when I started an internet pile on, on Billy and his wokey parents. Nothing says I will not tolerate being called a bully, like tweeting a seven-year-old boy to man up and go top himself. I can't stand these performative gestures. The only movement I show solidarity and support for is the continuation of our monarchy. Any person taking a picture down of our dear queen should be banished to one of those horrible little countries the queen herself helped liberate. Very nice. Sorry about the connection there. I'm not sure what happened. Um, Glasgow said to turn off the open, too much open on the PC. No, it's I, I actually rebooted the PC before doing, um, before doing the stream tonight. So I'm not sure what's happening there. Reset the router. I did actually. I've done all of these. I, I tried to do everything I can to to limit access to the uh, the resources on the computer. But okay, let's let's move on. Um, Moving on from Brexit, of course, <sighs> things are not going very well when it comes to the pandemic. It's called uh, a swirly, by the way. I've got the Yes Minister box set. The series aired 1981, 1982. Okay, thanks for sharing that video, uh, uh, Killer. So it says foreign trips um, risk screwing up domestic unlock, says Grant Shapps. So it says here, loosening restrictions on uh, international travel could screw up par uh, the progress made by the UK vaccina vaccination drive, Grant Shapps has warned. The Transport Secretary told Sky News on that Britain must wait for the other countries to catch up on the inoculation rates before unlocking. I think most people would agree that it, uh, we've got to be cautious, he said, and the transport secretary wants transport to happen. I want international tra transport to happen, but I think most people appreciate that uh, is what we need to do is what we need to do is to open up cautiously. No one wants to see us doing uh, doing now. Sorry. What no one wants to see us doing now is to screw uh, all that up by inadvertently reattracting the con coronavirus into the country. Wouldn't it have made sense to close the borders some time ago um, and stop the variant from coming into the country? But um, <laughs> internet con man Grandshaps. <laughs> is that his real name? What is his real name? It comes as leading co government advisor Dr. Jen Jenny Harris um, Harris. Chief Executive of the recently formed UK Health Security Agency today said the decision to reopen on June the 21st was on a knife edge. And it seems to be getting worse, it seems, because, of course, there are new cases rising. I'll show you now if this loads. Um, things maybe have sped up a bit better now. This still remains... So it seems that cases are rising once again um, related to this new variant, the, the Delta variant. And uh, this may mean that Boris Johnson will eventually have to come out and say, I'm sorry, we're not following. Um, we're following the data now. We're not following the dates, finally, because it seems that it may be necessary to end the restrictions. It's a picture of hope, but across a deep pandemic the variants change. The dilemma does not. Today, new data on the Delta variant further threatens the so-called unlocking, as the variant appears more contagious than the Alpha that led numbers to rocket in late 2020. There are currently over 42,000 COVID-19 cases in England. The Delta variant carries a 60% increased risk of transmission within households compared to the Alpha variant. 
90% of those some 33,000 people are carrying the Delta variant. People have died. 23 were unvaccinated. 7 had received only one dose. And 12 had received two doses. That's really weird. How is it possible that people who received one dose are in a, in a minority to those who received two doses? Um, like only seven died where, who received one dose. No, what am I doing? <laughs> of course, that makes sense. Yeah. So some... Um, so the, sorry, I'm I'm I was confused there. <laughs> um, so the, those who received um, no the the higher number of deaths was from people who did, yeah who did received two doses. You would think the higher number would be from the, those who received one dose. I don't understand that. I, I'm I was not confused. <laughs> the numbers are doubling in less than a week at the moment, and so if you carry on thinking about that doubling of of numbers that may be going on over the next. A um, few weeks, we're going to very rapidly get to very high numbers, and inevitably, that will lead to a lot more hospital admissions. Here in East London, there's an urgency for the vaccine as COVID looms over our summer. Uh, Big Mash, great to see you on the stream, Big Mash. So, it depends on their age and stuff. Okay, yes, because some people, um, the younger people, have maybe just got one jab, uh, while the older people have gotten two. But the older people are more. Uh, vulnerable. This new data shows that the overwhelming majority of new COVID cases are of this Delta variant. There is an underlying warning. Although the number of people being vaccinated in centres like this one has been encouraging, there are still people being hospitalised and the majority of which have not been vaccinated. It's therefore no surprise that the UK Health Security Agency has stepped up its plea to the public to please get vaccinated. However, there are questions over another key pillar of our COVID attack plan. The US-based Innova Medical Group supplies centers like this with lateral flow tests. Now, the American Food and Drug Administration has written a damning warning stating the devices are false or misleading. But that can't be possible because surely Matt Hancock knew which ones he was buying. Surely Matt Hancock did not just choose a random supplier perhaps he chose a supplier that's connected to the conservative party who is responsible for the procurement of these and recommend that they destroy the tests by placing them in the trash wow these are the lateral flow tests we have all become familiar with using and th there have been comments about these lateral flow tests in the past many people have said or many um i think it was those from Interna um, Independent Sage have said that the lateral flow tests are not reliable. That is facing severe scrutiny. Innova, the company behind them, told Channel 4 News that the FDA evaluated the data. The Department of Health, who have bet big on these tests, and their Innova test has gone through a rigorous assessment here, but this will not stop the questions. It's particularly concerning because not only are we using these tests sort of and, and mass testing, we're also using them to replace isolation in certain, set, certain settings. Uh, for example, in schools, there are trials ongoing right now that are replacing isolation of contacts with serial testing with these particular tests, which have been shown to be not highly accurate and having them in classrooms could potentially put children at risk. Oh, my God. Um... So telling people not to self-isolate, but just carry out these tests, which are not reliable. Testing is a front line against COVID. In Staffordshire, surge testing begins on Monday. The European Football Championships begins today in Rome, with gatherings across Europe, in England and Wales this weekend. If isolation stops COVID spreading, what happens when this tournament brings an entire continent together as a viral variant grows? Now, it seems that world leaders may finally have clocked onto the mantra no one is safe until everyone is safe. Boris Johnson has pledged to donate 100 million vaccine doses to poorer nations in the next year as part of a plan due to be unveiled by the G7 leaders this weekend that will see 1 billion jabs provided to the world. The US president has pledged 500 million. But how far will this really go and when will those vaccines actually arrive? <laughs> 
this seems to be um, a common problem here is that we want to vaccinate our own people first and well we'll deal with the the other countries around the world when we get round to it um the problem with this approach is that if we don't have if we don't approach if we don't reach as many people as possible there's a risk of new variants developing like in india the indian variant which is now called the delta variant we can't just vaccinate our, ourselves and then say okay we're we're protected because as i said and there's the evidence to to back this up the more the more that are unvaccinated the more pockets um that are unvaccinated around the world this allows for new variants to to arise and there's a risk that we could eventually see variants that are resistant to vaccines and then we're back to square one again altogether g7 leaders will pledge 1 billion vaccine doses but the world health organization says 11 billion are actually needed to try and eradicate the virus the grab for jabs by richer countries has been criticized by the who the G7 nations alone have bought over a third of the world's vaccine supply, despite making up just over 10% of the global population. 85% of jabs have gone into the arms of people and the higher income, less than 0.5% of doses have been administered in low-income countries. We're halfway through the year and the COVAX program, which aims to acquire vaccines for poorer countries, has delivered just 4% of the doses promised. Here in Cornwall, where the G7 are meeting, more people have been vaccinated than the entire populations of the 22 poorest African nations. My God. Oops, I, I lost that for a moment. Here in Cornwall, where the G7 are meeting, more people have been vaccinated than the entire population. So, this is insane. So more people in Cornwall have received the vaccine than these African nations. We're approaching this this virus completely the wrong way. We're we're choosing to vaccinate our people because they vote. Governments are vaccinating people because people vote. Not because it's the right thing to do. Not because it's the right way to deal with this pandemic. We're, we're going to go... This is their approach... And when the next virus comes along, they're going to deal with it in exactly the same way. Populations of the 22 poorest African nations. The aim in the UK is to offer all adults two vaccines by the end of September. But for adults across the world, it is the end of next year. A long time to wait, increasing the possibility of new variants emerging and travelling. Well, earlier I spoke to Dr. Ngason, the director of the Africa Centers for Diseases Control. He told me he thought that African adults should be prioritized for vaccines before UK children. But first I asked for his reaction to the fact that more people had been vaccinated in Cornwall, a county of 500,000 people, than in Africa's 22 poorest nations. Uh, a worse nightmare have come to reality. When this pandemic started, we cautioned that if we did not work in a cooperative way and express global solidarity, we may actually run into a moral catastrophe. There is no other word to describe it today than uh, that current, the situation we find ourselves is, which is really uh, a moral dilemma. It's, it's depressing. African nations always get the, the, the worst end of the stick, the bad end of the stick, or how, however you say it. Um, they need it and we're instead making sure and I'm not blaming the UK here this is happening all over Europe this is this is a north-south um, the global north global south divide here we look after ourselves first and then we'll we'll deal with the agents when we when we get around to it we you know we'll 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 appear in um in a few newspaper front page articles about how we're how we're donating so many vaccines or how we're planning to donate so many vaccines and then once they it goes off the front pages then we forget about it capitalism at its worst a moral catastrophe 
What should this summit do, the G7 summit, the gathering of the world's richest leaders do in order to deal with this catastrophe? The, the, my message to this, the leaders of the G7 at this summit is simple. Redistribute those excess doses of vaccines that are currently stored in warehouses in those rich countries. Secondly, do that quickly. There's a big debate in this country going on about whether children or young adults should be vaccinated or whether those doses should be sent abroad to countries in Africa, for instance. What's your appeal to the British population, to the British government in that particular debate? Another problem with this is that because these nations are so far behind in the rollout of their vaccine, means that they're so far recovering from the, the damage that's taking place to their economies. So these countries that are, have made, you know, struggled to make progress over the last number of decades are now being reset in a sense. They're being pushed back many years. That progress has been lost and so many initiatives have been put on hold and they will remain frozen until they, um, they receive their vaccines. And as you saw in the report here, it says 2022, December 2022, when most of the world will have received the vaccines. So there's two years lost when the global north has lost about one year. Uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for that super chat. Uh, need to remove the intellect, in, intellectual property rights for the vaccines. Yes, 100% agreement there. It's ridiculous. D many of these companies received a huge amount of funding through universities, through um, government bodies in order to get these vaccine, vaccines produced and developed. And many of them are profiting from it at the moment. Which is ridiculous. We Our tax-paying pounds, euros, dollars went into the development of these vaccines, either directly or indirectly. And these companies are profiting from it. Yeah, but our stand in that debate is simple, that our, we should be guided by science. And the science t teaches us that, I mean, yes, young people and children are infected, but they may not actually develop severe disease. So uh, it is important that we, we strive to vaccinate more globally so that we suppress the emergence of these variants and bring the pandemic under control and then of course that will give us time to vaccinate whoever needs a, or wants a vaccine so african adults should take priority over british children african adults uh, should take priority uh, uh, not in a competitive manner but collectively i think the uk has enough vaccines to uh, redistribute and still be able to meet its domestic needs. I think they And there's also a, di a difference here economically. Like us in the North, in the global North, can afford to tell people, look, we, you need to self-isolate. We can afford to do that. African nations can't afford to convince their populace to self-isolate, uh, to, self to remain at home. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Now, the leaders meeting here will say that actually they've been extraordinarily generous. President Biden yesterday pledged more than half a billion doses of vaccine. Uh, Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, will add another 100 million to that today and other countries will also weigh in. Are you saying that their generosity just isn't generous enough for the continent of Africa? We are very thankful for those uh, gestures of good wills that uh, are ex being expressed by President Joe Biden and the, the British Prime Minister. We are extremely grateful for that because we have nothing. So we are very grateful for anything that we have. A journey of 1,000 miles begin with, with a first step. So this is, we believe this is the first step in a collaboration to enable us get to 1.5 billion dollars. He has nothing to be grateful for. This is also protecting ourselves. If, if we're able to stop variants arising in, in Africa, in South America, in Asia, then we're actually protecting ourselves as well. So the African nations have nothing to be grateful. We're actually, as I said, we're protecting ourselves by actually making sure that they get vaccines. Um, let's, let's move on. Um, <laughs> did Michael Gove break the law? So it says here, we proved in the High Court, this is from The Guardian, it says, we proved in the High Court that Michael Gove broke the law so what happens now? Well, nothing happens. Spoiler, nothing happens now because Michael Gove is a Tory and we don't generally see Tories getting punished. So the pandemic 
was uh, was starting to hit. To manage public health, government needed to influence public behavior. To influence public behavior, it needed to understand how different health messages would land. To understand how messages would land, it needed to, uh, feedback from focus groups. And getting focus groups meant getting external help. But from whom? Dominic Cummins, Boris Johnson's chief, um, chief then chief advisor, wanted public first. It was run by his friends through, though, Dom, uh, though Cummins claimed it, he had, uh, it had no influence on his advice. <laughs> really? Um, yes. He had worked with it, uh, with, sorry, with its key people for decades. He said that it should be given the contract. At what stage would people just say, just, I, I would prefer the Tories just to come out and say, yeah, we're corrupt, but there's nothing you can do about it. Civil servants took it as an instruction. Like if Dominic Cummins, who's the chief advisor of the prime minister, says, hire this company, of course they're going to hire that company. The cabinet office gave the, gave the contract to public first. It was first revealed uh, by The Guardian and Open Democracy last July. The Good Law Project, where I work, took, uh, this is from uh, from The Guardian, uh, took Michael Gove, the minister in charge of the cabinet office, to court to prove that he had broken the law. But the high court, um, before the high court, our argument was, was that this looked like favoritism. The legal phrase is apparent bias, and it was unlawful. The high court agreed. It rejected Gove's arguments that no one else could do the job. Um, the truth is, it found that there was no one who had, sorry, no one had even considered giving the contract to public um, contract to anyone else. It appeared to be a reasonable observe, sorry, it appeared to an, uh, a reasonable observer. Sorry about that. That being a legal test, as though public uh, public first relationship with Commons and Gove had won the contract for it. Gove had indeed broken the law. So does it matter? So the problem with all of this is that it doesn't really matter. Dominic Cummins uh, handed a contract over to um, his friends. The cabinet minister, Michael Gove, signed off on it and nothing will happen. That is the problem here. Because Boris Johnson has an 80-seat majority, Parliament has no power, they can, uh, even the courts, what are they going to do? Uh, Ehrman, thank you so much for that super chat, I almost missed it. Um, if the G7 countries uh, won't help, will it be China or Russia or both? I don't think China... Um, see, I don't think China would do it for the reasons that would be necessary. And Russia don't have the capacity. So China could do it, but I don't think China really care about um, stopping new variants. The, otherwise, they would be rolling out new... Um, they'd be shipping vaccines over there, and they're not. For, you know, through... In order to uh, maintain their soft power around the world, it would make sense for China to do that. But they're not doing it. The Good Law Project has plenty more of these up their sleeves. It's quite depressing to hear, you know, what, what I've been following some of the, the, the Good Law Project's um, cases. And um, they, they were right. They're right. They're right. They're right. They, um, but nothing ever happens. That's the problem with all of this. Vaccine skepticism is rife in Africa uh, due to West sending low-grade medicines. There's so many things that are combined. Um, lack of education, of course, is an issue as well, um, where superstition takes over instead, and people are convinced by witch doctors or what. I'm not, I'm not generalizing here, but... Um, and as you said, um, Western medicines that have been tested, for example, in African nations as well, seeds distrust. So there are a number of different factors. Um, and then also, you know, lack of investment um, in infrastructure or in, in healthcare is also a problem. And this is, of course, related to 
um, debts that many of these countries have with with the World Bank or the IMF. It's a signal that to the Brexit faithful that they can uh, salam each law. You're just over the line here. Of course, Africa um, should be grateful as it gifted vaccines. It should not assume automatic self-preservation as a reason to gift vaccines. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, they will also be selective in who to send the vaccines to. Note, not vaccine. Um, that would be mean. China has a strong influence in Africa. Land to secure their food supplies might influence the way the vaccines um, might influence their view on vaccines for Africans. Yeah, they, they may send the vaccines to places they can uh, extract resources from, not actually protecting the entire continent. Has anyone been punished at all? Exactly, HQ, HK. No one has been punished and no one will be punished, unfortunately. So I want to go from one gammon to another gammon. <laughs> uh, gammon news. So it says here, <laughs> oh my God. Um, Andrew Neil, Neil, GB News, my war on woke and the problem with Piers Morgan. So those who don't know, the UK is going to receive, I, I thought it had already rolled out, but it seems to be gradually being rolled out is um, a new channel or outlet called GB News, Gammon News, I like to call it. The, the real problem begins, Andrew Neil in his Scottish blur uh, that will be familiar to anyone who has watched him uh, grill politicians over the 50 years of his career in the media, is that we are so, so many uh, delicious issues around cancel culture that it is hard to decide what to pick for woke week. He is referring to the five-minute segment on his TV show beginning this Sunday on GB News, a bold new, cha bold new channel, which is already highly controversial, impressive, given that it has not even launched yet. So this uh, GB News, so it's backed by, of course, um, Rupert Murdoch. It's probably going to emulate Sky News in Australia, which is completely fascist i'm not even going to say right wing it's it's border borderline fascist or it's it's completely over the top fascist um i recommend just watching anything from sky news australia not sky news uk sky news uk is different but sky news australia is just over the top uh and i think gb news is going to copy that or it's going to try and emulate fox news in the united states they try to present themselves as an alternative. Yes, we already we already have alternatives like talk radio, which is absolute crap as well. Um, just lies masquerading as facts or as news. Uh, Philippe, thank you so much for that super chat. Nothing will happen while parliamentary immunity is in effect. Yes. Um, the problem with all of this is that Boris Johnson could eventually be punished but he will be out of office when he's punished. And when he's out of office, he has no power. So the punishment change politicians of the day. Boris Johnson needs to be punished now, not in five years time. Dr. Johan, thank you so much for that super chat. That's cool. <laughs> Stay fit. Um, who's buying advertising? Boycott them. Uh, GB News has to be uh, more sly. And they will be. It could be directly in your face. We'll have to see. Talk radio is Murdoch as well. Yes. I will. Why doesn't Rupert Murdoch just go and live on an island? Leave things alone. He's already made his billions. Why do these people always have to make the world worse? Just stay far away from all of, of, of the world. Get, or even, you know, go and live. On, let the rest of us get on with our lives. Uh, try and making the world a better place. The, these people are trying to, you know, trying to stop progress. It says it will be free to air and sees itself as the antidote to rolling news, carving up a clock, um, carving up the clock from 6 a.m. to midnight with appointment 
to view personality-led shows like um, like they have in the US, of course, and the attitude you don't see on British television at the moment. There will be a radio station too launching next month. It will bring greater plurality of voices to the UK and in the UK media. Yes, they'll be all Brexiteers, but detra uh, distract detractors have called the channel a British Fox News and are calling for advertisers to boycott it. So if Neil72 is ruffled by uh, by this, he doesn't show it. It's all good publicity, he says, for anybody, for everybody that uh, wants to boycott. There are about 10 people who want to watch. Um, boycotts generally don't, don't have a huge impact. But when it comes to media, it actually does. Because businesses don't want to be associated with things like racism or sexism or anything reasonably controversial and you know uh, we sometimes underestimate the power of twitter if you have a, a twitter storm on a you know t directed at a business that is thing on this they will pull their advertising and this is damaging to the to the uh, to the business model because of, a lot of these <clears throat> don't <clears throat> excuse me the a lot of these don't operate at a profit they're they're funded by Murdoch, for example, but they like to have <clears throat> the advertising revenue as well because it helps you know top up the the salaries or whatever of the the celebrities on it. But um, the the boycotts actually do work. We've seen it in the United States where I think it was um, Tucker Carlson who was making racist comments and stuff. Um, a lot of the advert and our, our what's her name what's her name I can't remember her first name but the these people did suffer the consequence of businesses pulling their advertising revenue uh, it does hurt the show and they take off this they take the person off the air for a few weeks and then bring them back on it doesn't have a long term impact but it does certainly hit them in the pocket Neil is known f uh, for taking no prisoners. The politicians fear his forensic interrogation technique, including Boris Johnson, who refused to be interviewed by him um, in the lead-up to the uh, general election. The journalist James Denapol once said that he was trying to wing it in an interview with, with Neil. is like trying to dip in the rivers of Australia's Northern Territory and hoping that there are no crocodiles. Andrew Neil is quite good, but he's, but he's... Unfortunately, his blind spot, of course, is Brexit. So I think anyone could challenge him, you know, on Brexit and he would fall apart because Brexit falls apart with a little bit of scrutiny. I think somebody could easily stand up to um, Andrew Neil on the issue of Brexit and maybe other issues like Scottish independence, or whatever, which he's against. Um, you know, and you, you ask him a few difficult questions and he would fall apart as well. He'd get angry in the interview. <laughs> Uh, Neil is speaking to me from quarantine in West, Ing uh, West London, having recently returned from his house in Costa Azor, where he had been for the past uh, past year with his wife, Swedish engineer and communications ex executive Susan Nielsen, 52. They married in 2050. OK, and they have uh, blah, blah, blah. OK, she doesn't look 52. And he doesn't look 72, he looks about 82. <laughs> Still a gammon though. Uh, his blind spot is Murdoch. Yes. Okay, let's move it. Just want, just this is going to, pro it's probably I, it's probably something I'm going to respond to. Okay. Um, especially when it's when they're talking about Brexit, I'm definitely going to call out their crap. That's a promise. So staying on such an issue, I want to move on to. Um, now, let me read some of the, the chats first, of course. Uh, but is that he's unbalanced? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he's extremely unbalanced. Um, he's extremely biased towards the Tories and he's biased towards Brexit. Uh, woke culture, indeed. In my opinion, um, many identity-based social groups are likely uh, destined to catastrophic collapse. <laughs> Andrew Neil is a libertarian token reasonable converse conservative uh, I doubt it give Andrew Neil some credit um, 
go one to one with him and um and he will he will fear he will tear you apart and do it politely his takedown of um ben shapiro was pretty no i loved his takedown of ben shapiro ben shapiro ended up ending the interview basically calling andrew neil a leftist <laughs> okay leftists like you and he's like uh, uh, what <laughs> so but on brexit he he's he's on weak ground so i think look i'm not a debater okay so i probably wouldn't be able to go on andrew neil's show but if i think if somebody were to ask him questions about brexit i i think his position would fall apart Neil is a good, yeah, of, of uh, Ben Shapiro. He done a fantastic takedown of Ben Shapiro. Uh, ben Shapiro, but Ben Shapiro is not is not a strong uh, debater. He's not. He doesn't actually hold very strong. His positions are are pretty crap. So they're easily took taken apart. But it was beautiful to watch because I'm no. I hate Ben Shapiro. He's a charlatan. Um, it would be nice to see Andrew Neil take Nigel Farage apart if he was being objective use his skills but for the for the good not for evil uh, Marley thank you so much for the super chat have you heard of the upcoming centralized database the NHS and government are planning to implement this September yeah I, we talked about it on the stream last time uh, on Tuesday and um, it still seems to be whether it's safe or not um, there are many checks in place uh, I know some people who are on the stream, maybe on the stream tonight, I think maybe on the stream tonight, um, who have, um, who know about this much better than I do. And they said that there are measures in place to make sure that data is protected, that any data that is collected, um, you remain anonymous. And so it's, that's what they have said. So I have to resort, I have to resort to those people. He thought Neil was lefty. That was the art of the interview. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. <clears throat> okay. Property developers gave Tories £891,000 in the first quarter of 2021. This is back to my old stomping ground. You know, when you give money to politicians, they do you a favor. If you give £891,000 to politicians, they'll do you a favor. So Labour um, accused ministers of selling out commodities after analysis of recent um, donations. So Labour has accused the Conservatives of of selling out commodities, uh, communities, sorry, uh, to pay back developers, not commodities, <laughs> now they've become commodities, to pay back developers after figures revealed that 13% 13 of the Tories' recent donations came from property tycoons and companies. Labour's, see, this is the diff, like, I'm, you know, I'm critical of the Labour Party, but the vast majority of the Labour Party's money comes from trade unions, from um, workers. That's where they're <clears throat> not from businesses. It's not from um, multimillionaires or billionaires. There are a few multimillionaires who give money to the Labour Party, but that's on social issues. It's not about here's some cash, create a new law that allows me to pay less tax. Um, so a liberal's analysis of the declaration um, declarations re released by the electoral commission showed that the firm gave that eight hundred ninety one thousand nine hundred eighty four pounds to uh, Tory central office and eight local associations, a sizable chunk of the six million four hundred eighteen thousand two hundred ninety five pounds the country uh, the party reported reported receiving in the first three months of twenty twenty one six million pounds. Where does that money go? I know Boris Johnson likes to spend it probably on wallpaper, but where does that money go? It comes as the government prepares to launch sweeping changes to the planning system. There we go. And uh, that Labour says will remove communities' rights to object to inappropriate individual developments in their area. Um, so it's basically the companies give money to the Conservatives. The Conservatives change the law. And we've seen this in reports. I've, I've you know, I did some videos on this. Um, and what policy would you like us to change? You've given us money. What policy do, do, do you not like and we'll change it for you? Or is there anything you would like and we'll, um, we'll throw it into, our, uh, into the mix and see what comes out? That's how it works. 
oh, you, you want to build a, a shopping center in a, in a forested area? No problem, we'll just change the rules. Social issues are divisive too, though. I'm completely against money being given to politicians. Um, but it's uh, but if they're giving it for social issues, that's slightly different. Because they're, they're, that person is not getting something in return. They're make, making sure that a policy is implemented that helps other people or that it stops the government from doing something that harms people. Um, Max, is Italy the most corrupt, uh, still more corrupt than the UK? Don't know. <laughs> don't know anymore <laughs> uh, don't know anymore i i don't know at this stage <laughs> um italy has much has a pretty strong reputation for being corrupt but i, I think the tories are trying to you know be world beating here uh, of course disgusting they don't care about any of us they only care about the rich and powerful that's what they're that's the tory party's policy that's what they exist for that's their real that's all they exist for, is to make sure that businesses and millionaires and billionaires are protected. They don't care. They've never cared about the, the poor, the working class. They haven't, they don't, and they never will. But they're very good at convincing the poor and the working class that they do. And no matter how much we point it out, unfortunately, many people will continue to think that I need to vote for Boris Johnson because I like him. I like the way he ruffles his hair. Or I, uh, I need to vote for the Conservatives because the Labour Party want to tear down statues. It doesn't matter if the, if the Tories are tearing down the, the welfare state that's protecting us, that, that's making sure that I'm able to put food on the table and don't have to go to a food bank. Now, it doesn't matter if the, the Tories are tearing that down. The Labour Party quote-unquote want to tear down statues they want to tear down pictures of the queen in universities <sighs> and the public lap it up they, they're they convinced by this um ministers are aiming to centralize and accelerate the house uh, the house building process in england to help boost home ownership in areas across the, the north and midlands which are seen as increasing levels of conservative support. The way to turn people into Tories is to make them homeowners. To turn them into into Tories when they're homeowners, if they're not, is to allow them buy to rent. Let them become landlords. Then they will certainly support the conservatives. Not saying all landlords support the conservatives, but generally that's the case. Um and they'll make sure that you are looked after. The, the tenant will not be looked after, but the, the landlord will. And it's, I think it's a cultural issue as well that trying to convince, trying to allow more people to become homeowners. Um, many, many people want to become homeowners and that's the same in Ireland, for example. Um, if we look at countries like Germany, there isn't a huge appetite to becoming a homeowner because it's actually cheaper to rent. That sounds insane in countries like um, the United Kingdom and Ireland. But it makes more sense to um, it makes more sense to rent. It's cheaper in the long term. It's much more expensive to to own a home, uh, and it's not really cost effective to rent it out unless you have a huge uh, portfolio. So generally individuals don't rent out homes someone in the in the chat can probably correct me but that was that was the case i think a number of years ago it was Thatch, thatcher's classic plan yeah turn people into homeowners and then they will fear um <clears throat> they will f something it's almost perfect as a policy because if you turn people into homeowners then you've then you're able to sell them other policies oh you don't want you know certain groups of people coming into your community because you you don't want the price of your house to drop vote for the conservative um you want um lower taxes for example on your homes vote for the conservatives we're going to cut policies somewhere else but w making people homeowners is a huge uh win for any political party and the conservatives have realized we can do that we, we if we turn people into homeowners we sort of 
lock them into uh, becoming conservatives. Now, they can be completely liberal on, on social issues, but when it comes to economic issues, um, homeowners are more likely to be conservative. Uh, Germany has got a lot uh, has got a strong uh, heavy industry based uh, base to depend on they don't inflate housing markets and the consumer and consumer debt uh, social issues hurt people too yeah they depending on of course on the social issue yes I'm just saying that for example gay rights gay rights doesn't harm anyone <laughs> unless you're a bigot um, but if gay rights are being are being eroded around the UK, certain millionaires will say, "Look, I want to protect those rights. I want them to be maintained. So I'm going to help a party um, that's going to champion those issues. And for example, if it's the Labour Party who are champion, championing those issues, I'm going to get, donate money to that. Now, it doesn't. Does that help that business leader or mil millionaire personally? Probably not because they don't need uh, protection. If they need protection physically, they can hire the people necessary. Um, but are they discriminated against? Probably not because they have huge amounts of money, which does override a lot of uh, pre um, a lot of uh, prejudice, on fortunately or unfortunately. But they 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 don't want these rights eroded. They feel they say, look, I don't want. You know, there are millionaires and billionaires, not billionaires, I'm not so sure about, but millionaires who don't like children going hungry. They want the government to make sure the children don't go hungry. And they will back political parties who don't want children to go hungry. Now, those millionaires are not benefiting, their businesses are not benefiting, or they are not benefiting from that policy. But hum on a humanitarian level, they, they think it's important. Um, no, becoming homeowner is also huge in Germany, but it's also, also um, it's almost important impossible to pay for it in a popular area in big cities, where they usually have um, the best jobs are. So it is it is changing. It seems it, I, I know it probably in the eighties and nineties it wasn't really the case. Starmer is the most mediocre le le uh, leader of Labour ever. You know Corbyn was disliked, but <laughs> Starmer is meh. <laughs> Who? <laughs> what did he do? Uh, he's okay, but he's not. He doesn't. He's not enthusiastically hated or enthusiastically supported. Uh, strongly hated or strongly supported for the election. Which election? Because there are also by elections and council elections. Although maybe the great pink invader is being uh, sarcastic. I don't know. Stormer can't afford to wait for the election. He cannot. He needs to attack now. I said before, Keir Starmer needs to drop a few F-bombs. He needs to steal the limelight. Doesn't matter if it's for something positive or something negative. He needs to steal the limelight. Not not go over the board with, with the negative. But, you know, drop a few f Call Boris Johnson out by first name. Not, don't, stop calling him the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister does this. Say, Boris is an idiot. Try it. If it doesn't work, try something else. Um, Alexander, thank you so much for that super chat. Ben, Max, Ben Shapiro was taken down by his own supporters after he went after unions only to discover his listeners preferred <laughs> union protections. <laughs> because the people like Ben Shapiro, Max's buffering is due to the vaccine <laughs> enabled 5G access causing issues uh, with the waves. No. Uh, See, the, Ben Shapiro has arrived at a level where he attracted the attention of multimillionaires and billionaires, and they pay him money to produce content. Like, so if, if I was really big, <laughs> somebody may, may come to me and, you know, and say, Max, you know, we'd like you to sell a particular philosophy. The idea that, you know, uh, you know multimillionaires and billionaires really are the hard workers in society they're the ones who do the heavy lifting it's the the people at the bottom you know the the ones who deliver goods uh, or work in hospitals or work in in bars and restaurants th those are the lazy people and if you're you know if if we give you a lot of money can you convince your listeners or that that's the truth 
And people like Ben Shapiro would turn around and go, sure, I don't care where the money's coming from. I don't care what I have to sell. Um, I just care about the money. <laughs> Starmer should do blackface, Welsh face, and Scottish face. <laughs> what the hell? Um, Labour um, Labour needs someone with ch uh, charisma. Starmer is not suited to take over f um, take over the government. Another Tory victory incoming. Yes and no, because if Boris Johnson was replaced with Michael Gove, I changed. I think the dynamic would completely change. If Boris Johnson was replaced with, the dynamic would change. I think the the Tories are leading at the moment because of Boris Johnson, because the public like him. They don't like Michael Gove. They don't know Michael Gove. I think if Michael Gove stands up in Parliament, they 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 wouldn't shine to him. He doesn't have the charisma. I I hate saying it, but Boris Johnson does have charisma. I don't. I don't see it. <laughs> I think he's just a buffoon, a disgusting individual, a charlatan and a liar. But for some people, they like that. And he's able to sell it. Michael Gove, Rishi Sunak, um, Matt Hancock, these, are, these people are incapable of selling that type of persona, that type of lie. Um, so if Boris Johnson was replaced, I think the, the Tories would struggle. And it could be an opportunity for Keir Starmer to, to thrive. But with Boris Johnson, they need a new approach. Um, if Boris Johnson remains, they need to be more aggressive. Really hit, hit, hit. Beat him, beat him down in a metaphorical sense, in a, in a verbal sense, of course. Um, but opposition among Tory MPs has well aired in advance of the planning bill uh, being introduced to Parliament and a former Prime Minister Th Theresa May among the potential rebels to hold uh, to told the, sorry and who told the government to think again. Another backbencher Bob Seeley said last month that the plan threatened to to give our opponents uh, throughout England a rallying cry to save local democracy from the Tories. See, this is what these are the cracks that are appearing. These people need to be pressured. Because the Conservative Party will protect the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party care about cash, but they also care about protecting themselves. And if you're able to punch a few holes in the party, the party will react and they will hand the money back because they care about self-preservation. They will protect those MPs. They're more likely, they're more interested in protecting themselves than protecting the Prime Minister. They don't care about the Prime Minister. Boris Johnson is a tool for them. As soon as Boris Johnson loses his edge, as, as soon as he's no longer used, uh, suitable for them to, to manipulate, not in a sense manipulate, but to, when he has served his purpose, they'll throw him away. Like they did with Theresa May, like they did with um, David Cameron and, and John Major and all of them. Generally, the, the party will say, okay, can we win this prime minister? No, we can't get rid of the prime minister. Uh, but, the, but the way to get to do that is you need to put pressure on MPs within the Conservative Party. It's not about the Labour Party. The Labour Party are in, impotent in regards to dealing with this. It has to come from within the party, the Conservative Party. Labour needs firecrackers with, <laughs> with hot personalities. You know... <laughs> Maybe Lisa and Andy needs to do something a bit sexy. I don't know. <laughs> um, Keir Starmer needs to get into a fist fight with someone on the street. <laughs> they need to do something, you know, uh, with a Brexiteer, <laughs> um, because it, they need to show them. They need to show a human side, and they're not doing that. Anyway, let's move on. So, corruption within the Conservative Party, nothing new. Um, one moment. Uh, just, I just wanted to say on Andrew Neil for a moment because there was this article about Andrew Neil and Scotland. I wanted to show you. Um, Labour dithering on Brexit. The, the Labour Party, the Labour Party are afraid of Brexit. Why isn't this loading? Uh, the Labour Party are afraid of Brexit because they 
Still fear. Oh, can't re reach the page. Okay, here we go. Don't know what happened there. Um, they're afraid of Brexit because they're st they still fear that there are Brexiteers within the Labour Party that if they criticise Brexit, turn them off. Keir Starmer needed to be thrown out of that pub. <laughs> uh, Starmer couldn't punch his way out of a wet paper bag. Um, somebody needs to slap Starmer in the, state, in the face. Slap Star Starmer in the face. And then he can punch them back and get into a brawl. It could even be organized, you know. He needs to he needs to do something, you know. It can be faked. Um, get into a bit of a fist fight with somebody. I don't know, some guy beating his girlfriend or whatever, and Keir Starmer jumps in and beats up the guy. That that would that's exact. You know, they could organize it. Um, pay the guy up or do something. No, I'm joking. So Neil uh, Andrew Neil is fury in furious BBC rant before GB News launch. SNP gets free ride in London. This is insane. Okay, so Andrew Neil has spearheaded the launch of the GB News, which goes live on the thirteenth of July, June. Sorry, which is tomorrow. Oh, uh, or the day after tomorrow on Sunday. Um, and promises to shake up the shake up broadcasting in the UK by differentiating from the rolling news model. Okay, we, we talked about that before, but I just want to get to the SP part. After leaving the BBC to chair the new venture, the veteran journalist appeared as a panelist on Politics Live uh, that came uh, that came during the the segment asking what questions the UK could learn from the 2020 US election. Also on the panel was SNP MP Air Smith. Aaron Smith, uh, who highlighted structural differences between politics in the US, UK, uh, England and Scotland. He argued that the Electoral College and the first-past-the-post voting systems contributed to the alienation of large swathes of the electorate in the US and England, um, suggesting proportional representation would be more appropriate. But when host Joe Corbyn asked Neil for his take on the question, he lashed out, stating, the SNP get a free ride on the programmes that come from London. What planet is Neil, um, I was going to say Neil Armstrong, <laughs> Andrew Neil on? Uh, whether you've got PR, whether you've got PR or not, it doesn't really help you if you're left behind. What are you talking about? This is what I'm talking about. Neil, Andrew Neil is not that clever, okay? He's good at taking people apart, but he's not, he's not. A Miss Corbyn insisted the BBC never uh, never liked to give anyone a free ride and she invited and uh, she invited mr smith to respond the sterling mp said mr neil could do with a well deserved lie down <laughs> after a long shift covering the us election uh, as his frustration at the snp is showing through mr neil injected by demanding um, mr smith not mr smith not patronize him mr smith continued in no um, continued in november the SNP is winning the centre ground in Scottish politics because we have made the case, and uh, sorry, that has that we need more powers to deal with the issues that we're dealing with. And it goes on. Um, we've got the we've got an election coming up in May, so this is from before. Um, that we'll be able that we will sorry that will be for the people of Scotland to decide the best way they're governed and how our how best our constitutional future is represented the problems scotland have we don't shy away to fix them mr neil went on again and went again on the attack arguing there's not a single tool the scottish government needs to solve poverty issues well scotland can't raise all of its taxes so if it was able to raise taxes um all all the tax revenue it wanted then it'd be it would be able to solve certain issues but it can't uh, you control the education system, and yet the attainment gap between rich and poor kids um, has gotten what has gone wider. Uh, it's not a matter of power; it's a matter of policy. The election co concluded with the SNP winning a fourth consecutive term with 64 seats. This was an increase of one, but okay. And then, so Andrew Neil, it seems, is going to be on the attack in Scotland, and he believes that the SNP have a free ride in London. Really. Right. Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister, is treated like a real politician. She's challenged. Her qu the question's challenging. Boris Johnson is never challenged. 
Boris Johnson is allowed to lie and get away with it. His party are allowed to make up stupid crap and get away with it. Okay, and... I want to show you what I'm talking about, Boris Johnson. <laughs> still, I'm still, I'm still strangely attracted to his chin. <laughs> Let me see if this loads. <laughs> O'Neill puts puts the pineapple on the gown. <laughs> uh, I don't know why this is not working. Um, Neil has a face like a wet weekend in Middlesbrough. I think that is what. So you're going to hear Boris Johnson embarrassing himself. I think that is what uh, the people of the uh, of our countries now want us to to focus on. They want us to be sure that we're beating the pandemic together and discussing how oh my god what's wrong with this tonight and discussing how we'll never have a repeat of what we've seen but also that we're building back better together and and building back greener and building back fairer and more equal and uh, how shall I more in, in, in a more gender neutral and perhaps like a more feminine way how about that a more feminine way. How about that? Everything is a joke to him. I've said this before. Everything is a joke to Boris Johnson. Democracy is a joke. Brexit was a joke. Northern Ireland is a joke. Politics is a joke. His job was a joke. His relationships are a joke. Everything is a joke. Uh, bad, mad atmosphere in the room. Dreadful. Uh, how can Johnson pretend that anyone? We need to face fun uh, broadband. I, it's not my broadband. It, my broadband is good. It's, I'm not sure what's happening on this side. Jesus Christ. <laughs> what is he talking about? I have no idea. Well, he's, he mentioned gender neutral. Maybe it was like, yeah, look at me. Look at my credentials. Listen to how how woke I am. I'm saying gender neutral, even though I don't know what that means. And then um, more feminine. Is it because maybe Angela Merkel and um, Ursula von der Leyen were in the room? Is that why? I'm not sure. Andrew Neil's clean shaven chin <laughs> is the art is the work of art. He's also another. If you squeeze them, listen, fart. <laughs> He's trolling trans people. Bunny hugging joke. Okay, Mix, if, Max, if you're looking for, uh, for for the word, Bojo is a troll. That's it, and he's trolling everyone and everybody. And anybody, sorry. Yes. I need five G Max as uh, network Max. Yes. <laughs> really, don't understand. It's. I didn't have streaming problems tonight, but I had streaming problems on Tuesday. Okay. Anyway, we're almost at the end of the stream, guys. So I just want to share, just wanted to show you one um, weird story before we finish. Um, Johnson was uh, was bigging up the female security staff who turfed out the journalists. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> oh. No, I think it's a problem with my browser. It's not actually a problem with the connection. It's the browser, maybe. He's taking a, a, a he's taking a swipe at trans people. If this loads, please load. Neil dresses in his father's clothes while speaking in a Thatcher voice. <laughs> So it, this is in, this is in, so economist award awarded medal of freedom by Trump's uh, by Trump says low wage employees aren't worth fifteen dollars an hour. Um, 
so it says an economist favored by Donald Trump um, has triggered outrage for saying that low wage employees aren't worth fifteen dollars during a discussion about job automation. UBI job automation is going to take over. Uh, so jobs are going to be automated. AI robotics are going to take over. And this uh, um, former, well, it was somebody who was <laughs> a congressional medal by Don and uh, Don not was a congressional medal. Medal of Freedom by Donald Trump. So he says this guy is called Art Laffer. <laughs> How do these people? <laughs> Art Laffer. <laughs> This is this has to be a joke. I assume it's short for Arthur, but Art Laffer. Okay. In an interview on Tuesday, they told Fox Business uh, Fox News anchor Sandra Smith that groups including the poor and minorities were not worth a fifteen dollar ten ten pound sixty minimum wage for the first job. The poor, the minority. Uh, those with less ed- less education, young people who haven't had a, haven't had the job experience. These uh, these people aren't worth fifteen dollars an hour in most cases. the The people making these arguments have never worked a day in their lives. I'm pretty sure that Art Laffer probably inherited millions of dollars, maybe even more than millions of dollars, billions of dollars. I don't know, but he's probably stinking rich, and he's never worked a day in his life, and he's he has no understanding of what it's like to earn less than $15 an hour, you know, to pay rent, to pay bills, to feed yourself or feed your family. These people are completely disconnected from reality. It was working. Yeah, for, for those people, Sandra, who are coming into the labor force brand fresh, uh, not old timers who've been around for a while, the poor, the minorities, the disenfranchised, uh, those with less education, young people who haven't had the job experience, these yeah. people aren't worth $15 an hour in most cases. And so therefore, when you have a $15 an hour minimum wage, uh, they don't get that first job. They don't get the requisite skills to earn above the minimum wage. And after a few years, they become employable. And after becoming unemployable, they become hostile. And that what you'll find happening is this technology is... What do you mean they become hostile? <laughs> I, don't, I don't agree with his premise, but what does he mean by hostile? created an underclass of people who were really just bid out of the labor market and will remain out of the labor market for most of their lives. And this, I think, is just a tragedy. Uh, I love the technology, but the technology is replacing yeah. the jobs for these people. And Can we find a technology to replace him? Anyway, it goes on to say the argument that uh, federally mandated $15 uh, minimum wage would, in theory, cause unemployment. Following a warning from the former boss of McDonald's about increasing $25 to $15 an hour, as reported by Fox Business Network. It followed an announcement. Like, it's not about how much uh, you're not worth a living wage. It's it's not how, how much the mini- minimum wage is. It's, is it a living wage? Because if people are living and they have to pay rent, they have to feed their family or whatever. If this doesn't work, if this isn't enough, you know what happens? People have to rely on the government. They have to rely on the state. Where does the state get its money from? The taxpayer. So we, we because businesses are not paying people a living wage, we as taxpayers have to pay have to pay up have to make up the difference. We have to pay the difference. These people try, you know, try to sound smart. Oh, well, you know, these people are not worth this amount of money. Um, they they need to li- live on seven dollars an hour, which I think is about five less than five pounds an hour. How is somebody on five pounds an hour supposed to pay rent, pay bills, pay for food, um, and get out of that? Because if you want to go to university or college, unless it's some free course. You're going to have, and even if it is free, you'll need to take time off to study, to um, to attend these courses, which means you can't work during that time. You know where I'm going with this, okay? A UBI. But these people are so disconnected, but they're actually undermining their own uh, argument because they are paying for this as well. 
their taxes are going to pay for companies not paying their staff enough to live. Because th these people have to live and the state will have to step in if they're not able to uh, to pay their bills or whatever. They they have these people will have to seek so um welfare. Uh by the way Max, I'm sorry I'm late. I was uh having a long soak in the bath. Oh, I hope you I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> well deserved. So it says, Mr. Laffer, a former economic advisor to Ronald Reagan, who was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Trump in 2019, immediately faced criticism for his remarks about low-wage workers. You know, are you surprised that this guy used to be an advisor to Ronald Reagan <laughs> and he received the Freedom Medal from Donald Trump? Donald Trump really, really rubbed people's noses in it, didn't he? Why do you believe Americans uh, who are minorities or who are poor are not worth $15 an hour? Tweeted a Californian congressman, Ted Lieu. But Americans who are white, who are not poor, are, are worth... Uh, look, this is not the right approach to try and... Look, I don't, I'm not an expert, of course, in the States. And, but this is not a, an issue of about minorities. This is that nobody should have to earn less than $15 an hour doesn't matter what ethnic minority they are or ethnic ethnic group they are no one should be trying to turn it into a a, a net or a, a, ra a race issue i don't really ha i don't think it helps the case this is not or is a racist or not but no one should be on this type of money because we as taxpayers have to or americans as taxpayers have to compensate the businesses Uh, another Twitter Twitter user wrote, "Honestly speaking, Art Gaffer isn't worth fifteen dollars an hour. <laughs> Gotta love a little racism uh, with your classism." This is, I, I I didn't actually notice the racism, but I did notice the classism. This guy is completely disconnected from reality. Um, he doesn't care about people, as he regards as uh, poor or ethnic, because he he said the poor. Uh, I don't remember where where was it that he had said uh, he gave the list. Anyway, um, the Reagan elite, the Reagan era um, economist became a household name for the Laffer effect, which theorized that tax cuts would increase U.S. federal government revenue. <laughs> Although it is disputed by uh, by Democrats on the left, yes, like cutting taxes mean increases government revenue. <laughs> if I if I work less, then I receive more money. <laughs> it doesn't really work like that. Uh, like if you're paid by the hour, like the, you know, maybe if you're a hedge fund manager or something, you work less, you earn more money. But generally, if your pay is related, like what what is the what is the argument here? Yeah, we cut taxes. We increase revenue. I know their idea is like it makes businesses more efficient and more, but it's not taxes that are making businesses in, inefficient. It's bad management. Anyway, love Max, love a Max rat. <laughs> um, everything is coded for bare face racism. A campaign for 15 is 12 years old. My God. It's, it's out of date at this stage trickle down the trickle down effect that was part of the reagan uh, administration as well reagan policy trickle down economics yeah we the, the rich the idea completely insane so the rich we give money to the rich and then they spend it and it trickles all the way down to the poor and the working class um no the rich don't do that the rich hoard money they buy yachts um someone buying a yacht doesn't trickle down unless the yacht sinks and then it trickles down through in through the water um but it doesn't it doesn't work like that you it makes much more sense to give money to the people at the bottom because they will actually spend it in bars restaurants repairing their cars uh buying things the millionaires and billionaires don't buy things that are useful to the general uh to the economy as a, as a whole he should be paid in the 1920s, right? I agree. <laughs> Give him a wheelbarrow. 
So guys, we're the the stream tonight, so we'll have to finish there. Thanks to everyone who came on tonight. Thanks for smashing the like button. Thanks to everyone who sent a super chat. Um, greatly appreciated as always. Thanks to all the moderators for keeping the stream on the straight and narrow. So before we finish, of course, we have our one for the road, which is uh, Janie again. Um, Remember, I want everyone to have a wonderful week ago. We're going to see our one for the road. Uh, and as um, Boris Johnson always says, to stay alert. Ah, come on. Like parasites, they create scarcity and punish the poor even harder, citing credit risk as their excuse. And also the debt. They also use the debt as an issue of... Um, we can't give more money to the poor. We can't invest in uh, public services because we have so much debt. Oh, yes, sir. I can boogie, boogie, oogie. I am absolutely pure buzzing for Scotland and the Euros. I'm sitting round the back. Big Sandra, Philomena, CC McGlumford, all the lassies are coming round. I've got on my Scotland uh, jumper, my Scotland knickers, my Scotland top post socks and my Scotland sandals. Um, I'll be sitting there, we've got a wee uh, chimney, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, and we'll just be sitting there fucking cheering the team on, and I'll tell you right now, see if anything goes wrong and they get beat, I'm getting right into that house, I'm going to be smashing all my ladder ornaments and pulling that crying boy picture after a while, that's getting flung right over the dike, but I'm absolutely hopeful, pure fucking excited, yes sir, I can boogie, boogie oogie all night long. Just want to say though, everybody still look after each other. It's all out there. The COVID's still there. Keep wearing your mask. Keep two Alsatians apart. Look after each other. Come on, Scotland. We can do it. Oh. <laughs> so she boogies and she has her Scotland underpants. Scotland knickers. So. Uh, <laughs> so guys, once again, thanks for coming on tonight. Uh, thanks for making a wonderful stream. Really good stream tonight. Uh, thanks to everyone who sent a super chat. Greatly appreciated, and thanks to everyone, um, all the moderators tonight. Have a great weekend, everyone, and I'll see you same bat time, same bat channel at uh, 9.30 British Summertime on Tuesday. And for anyone who is a patron, do check out the these, um, these post-stream chat on Discord. You're welcome aboard. Have a great weekend, guys. I'll see you soon. Good night.